Good morning, everybody. It's uh, bright and early here in Connecticut, about six o'clock in the morning on Monday, and we are set to begin week three of this course. So we're twenty-five percent of the way through it. Um, so at this point, hopefully, you've turned in your week two uh, literary submissions, where you have to take a look at setting. Um, hopefully, you've also now responded to two of your peers on the discussion board, and uh, we can make our way into week three. So week three is all going to focus on tone and imagery. And imagery, of course, are words that the author uses to help us create an image, right? Um, and help us activate our five senses when we read. And activating our senses when we read is really important because it helps us stay engaged with a text and it helps us uh, create sort of the movie in our heads when we're reading. And there's been a bunch of research on this that shows that if we can sort of picture while we read, um, if we can create pictures of what we read, we're going to be better readers. Um, but it also makes books fun to read. Um, and sometimes the imagery that's used by an author, uh, the words that they specifically choose or their tone um, can help you get a sense of their style or can help create an emotional reaction in you as a reader. So what I thought I would do to just start off is read the opening page of my favorite novel of all time. It's called Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. And if you've never read it before, it sort of tells the story of uh, this soldier who comes back from World War II and he has uh, PTSD. And the PTSD is so severe that uh, he develops the ability to time travel. So, as I'm reading through this, and yes, it is a digital copy, I have a hard copy, but it has been misplaced, which I'm very sad about. But um, So let's take a look at this here, and let's pay attention to the word choice that Kurt Vonnegut uses, and you can think, as you're listening to this, what pictures are being created in your head. Here we go. All this happened, more or less. The war parts, anyway, are pretty much true. One guy I knew really was shot in Dresden for taking a teapot that wasn't his. Another guy I knew really did threaten to have his personal enemies killed by hired gunmen after the war, and so on. I've changed all the names. I really did go back to Dresden with Guggenheim money, God love it, in 1967. It looked a lot like Dayton, Ohio, more open spaces than Dayton has. There must be tons of human bone meal in the ground. I went back there with an old war buddy, Bernard V. O'Hare. And we made friends with a taxi driver who took us to the slaughterhouse where we had been locked up at night as prisoners of war. His name was Gerhard Mueller. He told us that he was a prisoner of the Americans for a while. We asked him how it was to live under communism. And he said that it was terrible at first because everybody had to work so hard and because there wasn't much shelter or food or clothing, but things were much better now. He had a pleasant little apartment and his daughter was getting an excellent ed education. His mother was incinerated in the Dresden firestorm. So it goes. He sent O'Hare a postcard at Christmas time, and here is what it said. I wish you and your family also, as to your friend, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I hope that we'll meet again in a world of peace and freedom in the taxi cab, if the accident will. I like that very much, if the accident will. I would hate to tell you that this lousy little book cost me in money, what this lousy little book cost me in money and anxiety and time. When I got home from the Second World War 23 years ago, I thought it would be easy for me to write about the destruction of Dresden since all I would have to do would be to report what I had seen. And I thought too that it would be a masterpiece or at least make me a lot of money since the subject was so big. But not so many words about Dresden came from my mind then, not enough of them to make a, a book anyway. And not many words come now either, when I have become an old fart with his memories and his palm malls and his sons full grown. I think of how useless the Dresden part of my memory has been, and yet how tempting Dresden has been to write about. And I am reminded of this famous limerick, and I'll stop there. So what stands out to me a lot about the imagery is um, how it's sort of like creeps in, right? Like you're hearing him talk about these sort of matter of fact things. And then he gives you this quick little violent image, like, um, 
Oh, but things were much better now. He had a pleasant little apartment. His daughter was getting an excellent education. Oh, this is it. Okay. That makes me feel sort of calm and relaxed and happy, I guess, or indifferent. And then all of a sudden this, his mother was incinerated in the Dresden firestorm. So it goes. Um, so we get this very quick little violent image and it sort of jostles us. But then he adds this line. So it goes like, oh, well, like he, he doesn't seem too bothered by it. Um, so we get two things here. We get the imagery, this shocking imagery, but then his tone's way different. His tone is almost unaffected or sort of dismissive of um, what's going on in the story. So I just wanted to read that as an example of how authors can use imagery and tone and how tone and imagery can sometimes be different. That um, imagery that we would think would make us feel one way is not necessarily how the author is writing it. So this week, what are we going to do? So this week, we're going to take a look at a couple readings and resources. We're going to look at uh, Hills Like White Elephants by Ernest Hemingway. Uh, we're going to look at Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. And we're going to look at Out Out by Robert Frost. Um, so the latter two are, are poems. And the first is a short story where a couple is having a um, sort of intense conversation in their relationship. And then um, you've got some other resources here about tone and uh, also about writing poetry inspired by artwork, which is what you guys are going to do this week. So what we have here is we have a uh, discussion board response, which again, your, your response is due by Wednesday. And your question is this, to which readings do you relate the most and why? So this should be sort of a personal connection. In two, two strong paragraphs, so please make sure you're writing two paragraphs. Explain what it is about the tone and imagery of the story that speaks to you and why. Use some text examples to support your response. And then you're going to respond to your peers. And use these peer response sort of questions to guide you. Um, for those of you who I've given feedback to where I said, hey, you should elaborate on your peer responses, use these to help. Please respond to at least two of your peers. How successful is your peer at explaining their choice and the tone and imagery of their chosen story? What might you contribute to their response? And then we've got the descriptive imagery literary response. I love this assignment. Um, it might be my favorite assignment of the entire term, but we'll talk more about this on Wednesday and I'll walk you through it. Okay. So that's it, guys. Plan out your week. Create a plan that works for you. I know we all get busy, um, but make a plan that works for you. Have a great week and I'll check back in with you on Wednesday. Bye.